In the dark and drafty cave, hacked from the heart of the palace, the librarian knuckled across the floor. He clambered over the remains of the sad horde and looked down at the splayed body of once. Then he reached down very gently and pried the summoning of dragons from the stiffening fingers. He blew the dust off it. He brushed it tenderly as if it was a frightened child. He turned to climb down the heap and stopped. He bent down again and carefully pulled another book from among the glittering rubble. It wasn't one of his, except in the wide sense that all books came under his domain. He turned a few pages carefully. Keep it, said Vimes behind him. Take it away. Put it somewhere. The orangutan nodded at the captain and rattled down the heap. He tapped Vimes gently on the kneecap, opened the summoning of dragons, leafed through its ravaged pages until he found the one he'd been looking for, and silently passed the book up. Vimes squinted at the crabbed writing. Yet dragons are not like in unicorns, I willin. They dwelleth in some realm defined by the fancy of the will, and thus it might be that whomsoever calleth upon them, and giveth them their pathway unto this world, calleth their own dragon of the mind. Yet I trow the pure in heart may still call a dragon of power as a force for good, in the world, and this and night, the great work will commence, all bathe been prepared. I hath labored most mightily to be a worthy vessel. A realm of fancy, Vimes thought. That's where they went then, into our imaginations. And when we call them back, we shape them like squeezing dough into pastry shapes. Only you don't get gingerbread men, you get what you are, your own darkness given shape. Vimes read it through again, and then looked at the following pages. There weren't many. The rest of the book was a charred mass. Vimes handed it back to the ape. What kind of a man was Demalachite? He said, the librarian gave this the consideration due from someone who knew the dictionary of city biography by heart. Then he shrugged. Particularly holy, said Vines. The ape shook his head. Well, noticeably evil then. The ape shrugged and shook his head again. If I were you said Vimes. I'd put the, that book somewhere very safe, and the book of the law with it. They're too bloody dangerous. Book! Vimes stretched. And now, he said, let's go and have a drink. Book! But just a small one. Book! And you're paying. Eek! Vimes stopped and stared down at the big, mild face. Tell me, he said, I've always wanted to know. Is it better being an ape? The librarian thought about it. Ook, he said. Oh, really, said Vimes. It was next day. The room was wall to wall with civic dignitaries. The patrician sat on his severe chair surrounded by the council. Everyone present was wearing the shiny waxen grins of those bent on good works. Lady Sybil Ramkin sat off to one side, wearing a few acres of black velvet. The Ramkin family jewels glittered on her fingers, neck, and in the black curls of today's wig. The total effect was striking, like a globe of the heavens. Vimes marched the rank to the center of the hall and stamped to a halt with his helmet under his arm, as per regulations. He'd been amazed to see that even Nobby had made an effort. 
The suspicion of shiny metal could be seen here and there on his breastplate, and Colin was wearing an expression of almost constipated importance. Carrot's armor gleamed. Colin ripped off a textbook salute for the first time in his life. Oh, present and correct, sir, he barked. Very good, Sergeant, said Vimes coldly. He turned to the patrician and raised an eyebrow politely. Lord Vetinari gave a little wave of his hand. Stand easy or whatever it is you chaps do, he said. I'm sure we needn't wait on ceremony here. What do you say, Captain? Just as you like, sir, said Vimes. Now, men said the patrician, leaning forward. We have heard some remarkable accounts of your magnificent efforts in defense of the city. Vimes let his mind wander as the golden platitudes floated past. For a while, he derived a certain amount of amusement from watching the faces of the council. A whole sequence of expressions drifted across them as the patrician spoke. It was, of course, vitally important that there be a ceremony like this. Then the whole thing could be... <clears throat> then the whole thing could be neat and settled and forgotten. Just another chapter in the long and exciting history of etc, etc. Ankh Morpork was good at starting new chapters. His trawling gaze fell on Lady Ramkin. She winked. Vimes' eyes swiveled front again, his expression suddenly as wooden as a plank. Token of all gratitude, the patrician finished sitting back. Vimes realized that everyone was looking at him. Pardon, he said. I said, we have been trying to think of some suitable recompense, Captain Vimes. Various public-spirited citizens. The patrician's eyes took in the council and Lady Ramkin. And of course, myself, feel that an appropriate reward is due. Vimes still looked blank. Reward, he said. It is Customary for such heroic endeavor, said the patrician a little testily. Vines faced forward again. Really, I haven't thought about it, sir, he said. Can't speak for the men, of course. There was an awkward pause. Out of the corner of his eye, Vimes was aware of Nobby nudging the sergeant in the ribs. Eventually, Colin stumbled forward and ripped off another salute. Permission to speak, sir, he muttered. The patrician nodded graciously. The sergeant coughed. <clears throat> he removed his helmet and pulled out a scrap of paper. Oh, uh, he said. The thing is, saving your honor's presence, we think, you know, what with saving the city and everything, or, or sort of, or what I mean is, we just had to go. You see, man on the spot and that sort of thing. The thing is, we reckon we're entitled, if you catch my drift. The assembled company nodded. This was exactly how it should be. Do go on, said the patrician. So we, like, put our heads together, said the sergeant. A bit of cheek, I know. Please carry on, Sergeant, said the patrician. You needn't keep stopping. We are well aware of the magnitude of the matter. Right, sir. Well, sir, first, it's the wages. The wages, said Lord Vetinari. He stared at Vimes, who stared at nothing. The sergeant raised his head. His expression was the determined expression of a man who is going to see it through. Yes, sir, he said. Thirty dollars a month. It's not right. We think... He licked his lips and glanced behind him at the other two, who were making vague, encouraging motions. We think a basic rate of her 
$35 a month? He stared at the patrician's stony expression. With increments as per rank, we thought $5. He licked his lips again, unnerved by the patrician's expression. We won't go below four, he said. And that's flat. Sorry, your highness, but there it is. The patrician glanced again at Vime's impassive face, then looked back at the rank. That's it, he said. Nobby whispered in Cullen's ear and then darted back. The sweating sergeant gripped his helmet as though it was the only real thing in the world. There was another thing, your reverence, he said. Ah, the patrician smiled knowingly. There's the kettle. It wasn't much good anyway. And then Errol at it. It was nearly two dollars. He swallowed. We could do with a new kettle if it's all the same, your lordship. The patrician leaned forward, gripping the arms of his chair. I want to be clear about this, he said coldly. Are we to believe that you are asking for a petty wage increase and a domestic utensil? Carrot whispered in Colin's other ear. Colin turned two bulging, watery-rimmed eyes to the dignitaries. The rim of his helmet was pass passing through his fingers like a mill wheel. Well, he began, sometimes we thought, you know, when we has our dinner break, or when it's quiet, like at the end of a watch, as it may be, and, and we want to relax a bit, you know, wind down. His voice trailed away. Yes. Colin took a deep breath. <sighs> I suppose a dartboard would be out of the question. The thunderous silence that followed was broken by an erratic snorting. Vime's helmet dropped out of his shaking hand. His breastplate wobbled as the suppressed laughter of the years burst out in great uncontrollable eruptions. He turned his face to the row of counselors and laughed and laughed until the tears came laughed at the way they got up, all confusion and outraged dignity, laughed at the patrician's carefully immobile expression, laughed for the world and the saving of souls, laughed and laughed and laughed until the tears came. Nobby craned up to reach Colin's ear. I told you, he hissed, I said they'd never wear it. I knew a dot boy to be pushing our luck. You've upset them all now. Dear mother and father, wrote Carrot, you will never guess. Oh, I've been in the watch only a few weeks, and already I am to be a full constable. Captain Voim said, the patrician himself said I was to be one, and that also he hoped I should have a long and successful career in the watch as well. And he would follow it with special interest. Also, my wages are to go up by $10. And we had a special bonus of $20 that Captain Vimes paid for out of his own pocket. Sergeant Colin said, please find money enclosed. I am keeping a little bit by, though, because I went to see Reet and Mrs. Palm. <clears throat> and Mrs. Palm said all the girls had been following my career with great interest as well, and I am to come to dinner on my night off. Sergeant Colin has been telling me about how to start courting, which is very interesting and not all complicated as it appears. I arrested dragons. <clears throat> I arrested a dragon, but it got away. I hope Mr. Varneshi is well. I am as happy as anyone can be in the whole world. Your son, Carrot. Vimes knocked on the door. An effort had been made to spruce up the Rambkin mansion, he noticed. The encroaching shrubbery had been pitil pitilessly hacked back. 
an elderly workman atop a ladder was nailing the stucco back on the walls, while another, with a spade, was rather arbitrarily defining the line where the lawn ended and the old flower beds had begun. Vimes stuck his helmet under his arm, smoothed back his hair, and knocked. He'd considered asking Sergeant Colin to accompany him, but had brushed the idea aside quickly. He couldn't have tolerated the sniggering. Anyway, what was there to be afraid of? He'd stared into the jaws of death three times, four if you included telling Lord Vetinari to shut up. To his amazement, the door was eventually opened by a butler so elderly that he might have been resurrected by the knocking. Yes, he said. Captain Vimes, City Watch, said Vimes. The man looked him up and down. Oh, yes. He said, her ladyship did say, I believe her ladyship is with her dragons, he said. If you like to wait in here, I will. I know the way, said Vimes, and set off around the overgrown path. The kennels were a ruin. An assortment of battered wooden boxes were lying around under an oilcloth awning. From their depths, a few sad swamp dragons whiffled a greeting at him. A couple of women were moving purposefully among the boxes. Ladies, rather. They were far too untidy to be mere women. No ordinary women would have dreamed of looking so scruffy. You needed the complete self-confidence that comes with knowing who your great-great-great-great-grandfather was before you could wear clothes like that. But they were, Vibes noticed, incredibly good clothes, or had been once, clothes bought by one's parents, but so expensive and of such good quality that they never wore out and were handed down, like old china and silverware and gout. Dragon breeders, he thought. You can tell. There's something about them. It's the way they wear their silk scarves, old tweed coats, and granddad's riding boots. And the smell, of course. A small, wiry woman with a face like old saddle leather caught sight of him. Ah, she said, you'll be the gallant captain. She tucked an errant strand of white hair back under a headscarf and extended a veiny brown hand. Brenda Rodley, that's Rosie de Vontmolay. She runs the sunshine sanctuary, you know. The other woman, who had the build of someone who could pick up cart horses in one hand and shoe them with the other, gave him a friendly <laughs> grin. Samuel Vimes, said Vimes weakly. <clears throat> My father was a Sam, said Brenda vaguely. You can always trust a Sam, he said. She shooed a dragon back into its box. We're just helping Sybil, old friends, you know. The collection's all to blazes, of course. They're all over the city, the little devils. I dare say they'll come back when they're hungry, though. What a bloodline, eh? I'm sorry. Sybil reckons he was a sport, but I say we should be able to breed back into the line in three or four generations. I'm famed for my stud, you know, she said. <laughs> That'd be something, though. A whole new type of dragon. Vimes thought of supersonic contrails crisscrossing the sky. Uh, he said, yes. Well, we must get on. Uh, isn't Lady Ramkin around? Said Vines. I got this message that it was essential, she said, for me to come here. She's indoors somewhere, said Miss Rodley. She said she had something important to see to. Oh, do be careful with that one, Rose, you silly girl. More important than dragons, said Vines. Yes, 
can't think what's come over her. Brenda Rodley fished in the pocket of an oversized waistcoat. Nice to have met you, Captain. Always good to meet new members of the fan scene. Do drop in any time you're passing. I'd be only too happy to show you around. She extracted a grubby card and pressed it into his hand. Must be off now. We've heard that some of them are trying to build nests on the university tower. Can't have that. Must get them down before it gets dark. Vimes squinted at the card as the woman crunched off down the drive, carrying nets and ropes. It said, Brenda, Lady Rodley, the Dower House, Querm Castle, Querm. What it meant, he realized, was that striding away down the path like an animated rummage stall was the Dowager Duchess of Querm who owned more country than you could see from a very high mountain on a very clear day. Nobby would not have approved. There seemed to be a special kind of poverty that only the very, very rich could possibly afford. That was how you got to be a power in the land, he thought. You never cared a toss about whatever anyone else thought, and you were never, ever uncertain about anything. He padded back to the house. A door was open. It led into a large but dark and musty hall. Up in the gloom, the heads of dead animals haunted the walls. The Rampkins seemed to have endangered more species than an ice age. Vimes wandered aimlessly through another mahogany archway. It was a dining room containing the kind of table where the people at the other end are in a different time zone. One end had been colonized by silver candlesticks. It was laid for two. A battery of cutlery flanked each plate, antique wine glasses sparkled in the candlelight. A terrible premonition took hold of Vimes at the same moment as a gust of captivation, the most expensive perfume available anywhere in Ankh Morpork, blew past him. Ah, Captain, so nice of you to come. Vimes turned around slowly without his feet appearing to move. Lady Ramkin stood there magnificently. Vimes was vaguely aware of a brilliant blue dress that sparkled in the candlelight, a mass of hair the color of chestnuts, a slightly anxious face that suggested that a whole battalion of skilled painters and decorators had only just dismantled their scaffolding and gone home, and a faint creaking that said underneath it all mere corsetry was being subjected to the kind of tensions more usually found in the heart of large stars. I, uh, he said, if you, uh, if you'd said, uh, I'd, uh, dress more suitable, uh, extremely, uh, very, uh. She bore down upon him like a glittering siege engine. In a sort of dream, he allowed himself to be ushered to a seat. He must have eaten, because servants appeared out of nowhere with things stuffed with other things, and came back later and took the plates away. The butler reanimated occasionally to fill glass after glass with strange wines. The heat from the candles was enough to cook by, and all the time Lady Ramkin talked in a bright and brittle way about the size of the house, the responsibilities of a huge estate, the feeling that it was time to take one's position in society more seriously, while the setting sun filled the room with red and Vime's head began to spin. Society, he managed to think didn't know what was going to hit it. Dragons weren't mentioned once, although after a while something under the table put its head on Vimes' knee and dribbled. Vimes found it impossible to contribute to the conversation. He felt outflanked, beleaguered. He made one sally, hoping maybe to reach high ground from which to flee into exile. 
Where do you think they've gone? He said. Their what? said Lady Ramkin, temporarily halted. The dragons, you know, Errol and his white female. Oh, some were isolated in the Rocky, I should imagine, said Lady Ramkin. Favorite country for dragons. But it's she's a magical animal, said Vimes. What will happen when the magic goes away? Lady Ramkin gave him a shy smile. Most people seem to manage, she said. She reached across the table and touched his hand. Your men think you need looking after, she said meekly. Oh, do they? said Vimes. Sergeant Colin said he thought we'd get along like a maison en flambe. Oh, did he? And he said something else, she said. What was it now? Oh, yes. It's a million to one chance, said Lady Ramkin. I think he said, but it might just work. <clears throat> she smiled at him. And then it arose and struck Vimes that, in her own special category, she was quite beautiful. This was the category of all the women his entire life who had ever thought he was worth smiling at. She couldn't do worse, but then he couldn't do better. So maybe it balanced out. She wasn't getting any, any younger, but then who was? And she had style and money and common sense and self-assurance and all the things that he didn't. And she had opened her heart. And if you let her, she could engulf you. The woman was a city. And eventually, under siege, you did what Ankh Morpork had always done. Unbar the gates, let the conquerors in, and make them your own. How did you start? She seemed to be expecting something. He shrugged and picked up his wine glass and sought for a phrase. One crept into his wildly resonating mind. Here's looking at you, kid, he said. The gongs of various midnights banged out the old day and further toward the hub, where the ram-top mountains joined the forbidding spires of the central massive, where strange hairy creatures roamed the eternal snows, where blizzards howled around the freezing peaks, the lights of a lone lamissary shone out over the high valleys. In the courtyard, a couple of yellow-robed monks stacked the last case of small green bottles onto a sleigh, ready for the first leg of the incredibly difficult journey down to the distant plains. The box was labeled in careful brush strokes, Master C. M. O. T. Dibbler, Ankh Morpork. <laughs> you know, Lob Sang, said one of them, one cannot help wondering what it is he does with this stuff. Corporal Nobbs and Sergeant Cullen lounged in, the, lounged in the shadows near the mended drum, but straightened up as Carrot came out bearing a tray. Det detritus, the troll, stepped aside respectfully. Here we are, lads, said Carrot. Three pints on the house. <clears throat> Bloody hell, I never thought you'd do it said Colin, grasping a handle. What did you say to him? <laughs> oh, I just explained how it was the duty of all good citizens to help the guard at all times, said Carrot innocently, and I thanked him for his cooperation. <clears throat> yeah, and the rest, said Nobby. No, that was all I said. <clears throat> then you must have a really convincing tone of voice. Ah, well, make the most of it, lads, while it lasts, said Colin. They drank thoughtfully. It was a moment of supreme peace, a few minutes snatched from the realities of real life. It was a brief bite of stolen fruit and enjoyed as such. 
No one in the whole city seemed to be fighting or stabbing or making a fray. And just for now, it was possible to believe that this wonderful state of affairs might continue. And even if it didn't, then there were memories to get them through, of running and people getting out of the way, of the looks on the faces of the horrible palace guard, of when all the thieves and heroes and gods had failed, of being there, of nearly doing things nearly right. Nobby shoved the pot on a convenient windowsill, stamped some life back into his feet, and blew on his fingers. A brief fumble in the dark recesses of his ear produced a fragment of cigarette. What a time, eh? said Colin contentedly, as the flare of a match illuminated the three of them. The others nodded. Yesterday seemed like a lifetime ago, even now. But you can never forget something like that, no matter who else did, no matter what happened from now on. If I never see any bloody king, it'll be too soon, said Nobby. I don't reckon he was the right king anyway, said Carrot. Talking of kings, anyone want to crisp? There's no right kings, said Colin, but without much rancor, ten dollars a month was going to make a big difference. Mrs. Colin was acting very differently toward a man bringing home another $10 a month. Her notes on the kitchen table were a lot more friendly. <laughs> <clears throat> no, but I mean, there's nothing special about having an ancient sword, said Carrot. What a birthmark. Oh, I mean, look at me. <laughs> I've got a birthmark on my arm. <clears throat> my brother's got one too said Colin, shaped like a boat. <clears throat> Mine's more like a crown thing, said Carrot. <laughs> oh, ho, that makes you a king then, grinned Nobby. Stands to reason. <clears throat> I don't see why. My brother's not an admiral, said Colin, reasonably. <clears throat> and I've got the sword, said Carrot. He drew it. Colin took it from his hand and turned it over and over in the light from the flare over the drum's door. The blade was dull and short and notched like a saw. It was well made, and there might have been an, inscri an inscription on it once, but it had long ago been worn into indecipherability by sheer use. It's a nice sword, he said thoughtfully. Well balanced. <clears throat> But not one for a king, said Carrot. King swords are big and shiny and magical and have jewels on. And when you hold them up, they catch the light. Ting. Ting, said Colin. Yes, I suppose they have to, really. Oh, I'm just saying, you can't go around giving people thrones just because of stuff like that, said Carrot. That's what Captain Vaughan said. Nice job, mind, said Nobby. Good hours, kingin'. Mm? Colin had momentarily been lost in a little world of speculation. Real kings had shiny swords, obviously. Except, except, except maybe your real, real king of, like, days of yore. He would have a sword that didn't sparkle one bit, but was bloody efficient at cutting things. Just a thought. <clears throat> I say Kingen's a good job, Nobby repeated. Short hours? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but not long days, said Colin. He gave Carrot a thoughtful look. Ah, there's that, of course. <clears throat> anyway, my father says being king's too much like hard work, said Carrot. Oh, the surveying and the saying and everything. He drained his pint. It's not the kind of thing for the likes of us. Us. He looked proudly. Guards. Are you all right, Sergeant? Hmm. What? Oh, yes. Colin shrugged. <clears throat> what about it, anyway? 
Maybe things turned out for the best. He finished the beer. Best be off, he said. What time is it? About 12 o'clock, said Carrot. Anything else? Carrot gave it some thought. And all's well, he said. Right, just testing. You know, said Nobby, the way you say it, lad, you could almost believe it was true. Let the eye of attention pull back. This is the disc, world and mirror of worlds, born through space on the back of four giant elephants who stand on the back of great Atuin, the sky turtle. Around the rim of this world, the ocean pours off endlessly into the night. At its hub rises the ten-mile spike of the Cori Celesti, on whose glittering summit the gods play games with the fates of men. If you know what the rules are and who are the players. On the far edge of the disk, the sun was rising. The light of the morning began to flow across the patchwork of seas and continents, but it did so slowly because light is tardy and slightly heavy in the presence of a magical field. On the dark crescent, where the old light of sunset had barely drained from the deepest valleys, two specks, one big, one small, flew out of the shadow, skimmed low across the swells of the rim ocean, and struck out determinedly over the totally unfathomable star-dotted depths of space. Perhaps the magic would last, perhaps it wouldn't, but then what does? The end.